Hello, my name is David Patterson. Uh, I'm a teacher of chemistry and physics at Oldham School outside Elstree um, in London. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, integrated instructions in practical work, how I develop them, um, how I use them in my classroom, some of the research I've done and published, uh, and the resources I've made available uh, for practical work in the secondary classroom. So, started. So um, this work uh, came about from work I'd been doing in the classroom anyway. I was lucky enough to be awarded a uh, small grant and support uh, by the RSC, Chemical Education Research Group. Um, so thanks to them for uh, the support, which really helped uh, push me uh, on to think about how to uh, research this uh, in a bit more detail rather than just using it and talking about it uh, with um, colleagues. Um, and this ultimately culminated in uh, this paper being published in Journal of Chemical Education uh, uh, last year. Uh, so thanks to um, the group for the sponsorship. Uh, Suzanne Fergus and Michael Seary uh, were my mentors for the year, and they were very um, useful um, collaborators to talk to uh, about uh, my developing research themes. Uh, the staff and the students at Oldham School um, and Steve Jones and Bob Wally, um, who have allowed me to uh, use their resources and also bounce ideas off in terms of uh, the micro scale aspect of integration instructions. So the outline of the talk is um, relatively simple. I would imagine most people have uh, some understanding of the idea of um, working memory and long term memory and cognitive load. So I'll just go through uh, some of the uh, basics on that. I'll look a little bit about extraneous load uh, in practical work and where the issues uh, of uh, engaging well with practical work come from. Uh, which really lead on to the idea of integrated instructions. Some of the results I've collected um, and the, the publication uh, will obviously have fuller details on that. Um, and then some of the resources I've uh, put a, um, out on my uh, personal blog. So um, in terms of working memory and uh, why it's hard for anyone to learn something new, uh, these ideas have been around for a long time. Um, Michael Seary pointed out uh, Johnson uh, who is obviously very famous in um, science circles um, with his ideas about uh, the chemistry triplet, um, was talking about working memory and how to make it, uh, practical work effective and the like uh, decades ago. So back in the 1970s uh, and 1980s, uh, he was working on this and thinking about how uh, the practical classroom can be very challenging for students. And he published this article uh, in chemistry, uh, Education in Chemistry back in uh, 82, talking about the work in memory and how the uh, lab environments can be a very overwhelming uh, environment for students to learn in. And this really comes down to the fact our working memory is limited. And if we're having to think about multiple things, uh, so many different new things, and bringing that all together to understand what's going on, uh, the ability to learn is, is severely limited. So some of the things that might be expected to be thought about in our working memory when we're doing practical work is the theory which underlies uh, what the practical is about, the skills, maybe we're learning new skills, the verbal instructions, if we haven't had have that on our instruction sheets and we, we kind of call out, oh, don't forget to use this reagent or uh, this is where we put things at the end of the practical. Uh, the input from the experiment itself, so what we're actually uh, expecting the students to learn uh, from the uh, practical and the data that they are um, collecting recalling skills, uh, the written instructions themselves, and obviously uh, all the apparatus. So these ideas uh, uh, have been around for a long time, uh, and there's been this uh, new wave of uh, using cognitive uh, theory and cognitive load theory to you know, examine our work in the classroom uh, of late. And so it, it's good to know that these ideas, you know, you can go back uh, through the literature and, and find good ideas uh, from, the, uh, from the past. So the basics of long-term uh, memory and working memory. So this is the atkinson schifrin model updated by Baddeley in the 90s to include um, or to change short-term memory into uh, working memory. Um, and very basic um, ideas that we have all of this input into our sensory memory from our eyes and ears and taste and uh, all the other senses. And the majority of that information gets dumped out. Um, because if we uh, had to process all of that, uh, we'd be completely overwhelmed. Um, so our sensory memory then shunts what we are paying attention to into our working memory. 
and we can keep stuff, we can keep information in our working memory if we're rehearsing it, like when we're trying to remember a number, code to a door or a mobile phone number. Um, but if we don't uh, attend to that information and make links with uh, information that we already know, uh, then we tend to forget it as for uh, working memory. If we are going to remember something, it needs encoding into our long term memory. And then if we're going to use that information later on, we need to be able to retrieve it uh, from the long term memory. And um, the process of or the, the size of that long term memory is uh, much, much larger than our working memory. Um, but if we don't attend to or retrieve information from our long term memory, uh, at some point it's uh, potentially forgotten um, over time. So basically this idea of the working memory as where we're consciously thinking, the key thing is it's limited capacity. And if we are overloading working memory, then task completion is impeded and students aren't able to learn because they, they can't process um, the new information new ideas or skills that we're trying to teach them. How is uh, information encoded into the long term memory? So this is where we come to the idea of schema. Um, and the example I like to use um, when talking about this is um, the idea of how we uh, would um, expect students to follow this instruction. If we ask them to heat 100 cubic centimeters of water uh, to 50 degrees Celsius, underlying those to us simple instructions, is a huge amount of prior knowledge that they need to be able to access and specifically they need to know which equipment to use and how to set it up so when you have a novice in the classroom and you ask them to do this this is a highly complex task for them because they don't necessarily know about tripods and causes and bunsen burners and thermometers and all that um, if you however ask a year 11 student or a sixth form student uh, that exact same instruction, then they've been introduced to all this equipment. They know about heating, they know about the different colors of flames and the like. And so that information has been contained within the idea of how to heat water. So if they're retrieving that information, that schema of heating water, that then just occupies one slot, if you like, in the working memory. And therefore, they're not going to be as overloaded as a year seven student who um, trying to tackle this seemingly simple task to us uh, is completely overwhelmed them because their limited working memory is held up or is, um, has, has got the information of a beaker as a separate idea and a tripod as a separate idea and a gauze as a separate idea. And so the idea of them being able to put it all together and complete the task is impeded by the fact that all of these are separate uh, bits of information. By learning it, by um, developing uh, over the years uh, and trying out these things multiple times, the idea of heating or the equipment to heating has been um, brought together into one chunk of information, one uh, schema which they can retrieve and use so that they can uh, apply those skills uh, much more effectively. So cognitive load theory talks about uh, what's happening in the working memory and why uh, our um, our working memories become overloaded um, and so it's split down into uh, the traditional model of uh, cognitive load theory has intrinsic extraneous and germane load um, intrinsic load is about the uh, complexity of concepts and how they're related to each other extraneous load is to do with how the instructions may be um, uh, presented to the students and external influences and germane load is this idea about using the um, load or using the, um, our working memory and the space in the working memory to build those schema to make those schema more complex and more all-encompassing as we learn new information so if we work on the assumption that our cognitive load is limited um, all of these loads the intrinsic extraneous and germane are going to um, be filling up that load so the uh, analogy here is the uh, measuring cylinder Ideally, we want to reduce extraneous load as much as possible because that will allow us to um, have more room in our working memory. Intrinsic load is trickier to deal with because um, some concept, concept, concepts are uh, intrinsically complex. And this is where we get to the idea of uh, breaking complex things down into simpler ideas and working up to more complex ideas. But ideally, we want to uh, have as much space in the working memory as possible for the germane load for them to be able to understand what they're doing and um, uh, develop their schema make their understanding of new concepts um, more sophisticated so this is obviously very broad brush uh, ideas about cognitive load and you can spend a lot longer going to this but 
where I came from in terms of developing integrated instructions was this idea of how do we make instructions uh, simpler? How do we make instructions less overwhelming, reduce extraneous load uh, to make um, uh, students be able to engage better with um, with the practical work? Uh, get into this idea of Abrams um, of uh, having their minds on during the practical work as well as uh, hands on. So. The classic example I use uh, when talking about this is the classic electrolysis experiment. So this is the, the Nuffield setup. Um, we're asking them to electrolyze salt water to produce hydrogen and chlorine and then test the gases to prove that when you electrolyze salt water, uh, you get uh, these two products. But I've watched enough students over the years when I use this uh, equipment, if this is the first time I do electrolysis, that their ability to think about what's going on in terms of the uh, chemistry, the microscale, uh, sorry, not the microscale, the um, submicroscopic ideas uh, of the electrolysis is severely limited by a lot of uh, stuff that doesn't impede me because I'm an expert, relative expert in this electrolysis. I've done it before. I know what the problems are. Uh, I can attend to what's going on, which is collecting the gas and testing it. But the students themselves might well be attending to all sorts of other things. Have they collected enough gas? How do they get the test tubes filled with the salt water beforehand? Have they got the Boston clamp right? It's a complex bit of equipment for a novice. Um, are the power packs working? Have they got the plugs in right? Are they short circuiting it? Are they spilling the salt water out of the big glass tube? Um, are they going to electrocute themselves? All of these things that they're worrying about, along with uh, in, in the days when we had practical work in classrooms um, in, in the traditional way, um, dealing with all the people around them and all the peer pressure and all the noise, all, all of those things, if they are attending to those in their working memory, the chances of them uh, dealing with and thinking about um, the underlying chemistry is quite limited. So one of the things we can do is reduce that extraneous load, simplify equipment, and this is where microscale chemistry comes in. You can do electrolysis uh, in just a droplet uh, of water in your Petri dish with a couple of uh, graphite rods or um, carbon fiber rods. Um, and so you're stripping away a lot of the uh, extraneous load in terms of the complex equipment and then just fitting equipment together and making it work. So this simplifies their, uh, what they have to focus on. They're just looking at a small area uh, of chemistry. It's very simple to set up. It's quick to check to make sure everything's working. And so they've got more of a chance to physically stand there and look at uh, the equipment, see the results they're getting and think and talk about uh, the chemistry that's uh, going on in front of them. In terms of integration instructions, it comes uh, with this idea of the split attention effect. So this is a, a nice uh, diagram from a um, journal article by Jenkins in School Science Review um, a couple of years ago. And the split attention effect basically says if the student is having to attend to information in two separate places, uh, they are spending some of their cognitive load jumping between those sources. Uh, so on the left hand diagram, you've got the uh, instructions overlaid on the picture so they can just look at that diagram. On the right hand side, it's the traditional labeling and they're having to jump between the key and the diagram to see what's going on. So potentially that's adding uh, extra load that they um, are not uh, having to, uh, that therefore that cognitive load is not um, available for them to be thinking about the concepts and not um, developing their schema. So where did integration instructions come from? Well, it turns out, as, as ever with lots of these things, you know, people have had these ideas before and there's um, prior research on this, which was useful when developing my own ideas. But I realized that I'd been doing these kind of integrated instructions for a while in the classroom and just the project allowed me to kind of formalize it a bit. And this idea that if you are giving students uh, just lists of instructions and potentially a, a diagram, uh, it's hard for them to um, see what they're doing in their mind's eye uh, about what the practical looks like. Uh, and so Deshri and others, um, ma mainly with um, university undergraduates, but some secondary as well, um, put these uh, instructions together. So you have arrows pointing about where um, solutions go. Uh, you simplify the instructions to make it much easier for the student to carry out the practical work and therefore um, make the observations and think about the chemistry that's going on. So this is a classic practical uh, that I talk about with integrated instructions, how we make copper sulfate crystals. Um, it's a very um, complex um, practical. It takes a long time to uh, 
uh, carry out in the lesson. There's lots of equipment involved. It can take quite a long time and you normally don't get to the end point uh, within the lesson because it's quite a uh, long and in involved practical. So this is one of the first ones I developed in terms of integration instructions. It's a slightly different practical. It doesn't heat up the acid with the uh, Bunsen. The heating comes later on uh, to concentrate the solution. But the, the basics of the integration instructions are there. Much more simplified instructions. Arrows pointing to where uh, chemicals and equipment are, are moved. And pictograms like the eyes to say uh, show precisely where uh, we are making observations. So when I did this practical with my students, um, they were getting to the crystals within 20, 25 minutes, uh, which is much different from um, the, the larger scale practical, the traditional way of doing it, where you are generally leaving the uh, evaporating dishes until several days later for the students to see the crystals, by which time um, potentially the learning points have uh, uh, are not as uh, strong because it's a long time since they've done that practical. So I collected some data uh, on this. I started blogging about it and um, EIC asked me to write an article on um, what the kind of key ideas around integration instructions were. And so uh, this is from uh, the article uh, in, in EIC a couple of years ago. And the key ideas were about keeping the equipment to a minimum, making the instructions as simple as possible, and numbering them, uh, preferably clockwise or anti-clockwise with tick boxes so they can track their progress. Um, keeping those, um, the, the pictograms, using those pictograms to uh, show where the observations are carried out. And generally, uh, I project these um, instructions up on the screen and they get a paper copy for themselves so they can stick it uh, into their books and they've got that record of it uh, right there for them. Um, I put out um, some of the templates I used um, on my blog a couple of years ago and Chemix um, at the moment is, is become quite popular for doing this. Uh, the, the chap who uh, codes this has done a great job of uh, making, uh, producing diagrams really simple so uh, that's available as well. So I use it with um, uh, microscale as well. Um, it's one of my favourite techniques in terms of carrying out practical work. Uh, so this one is just a neutralisation uh, between citric acid and sodium carbonate and everything is just within this uh, droplet of water. They're just moving a, a few crystals of each of the solid into the centre with the universal indicator. And then they just have to stand there or sit there and watch the chemistry unfold in front of them. So not faffing around, not needing to move around the classroom. They can sit and watch and just see the, um, the acid um, diffuse and the alkali diffuse uh, across the <clears throat> across the drop and then they can see the bubbles uh, being produced if they're patient enough. So when I was doing the actual research project, I was starting to um, uh, produce worksheets that they were then asked questions um, about their observations, what they understood in terms of the techniques, uh, the, the steps of the techniques they carried out. So really understanding uh, or asking questions about what they understood about the chemistry and what they understood about why they did particular steps. We did a crude oil distillation and I think I did one other as well in, in the um, paper that got published. <clears throat> so the key um, take home points from the data that I collected, um, all of my students were completing their practical work. Um, in terms of the questions they're asking, and this was one of the drivers uh, for um, producing integration instructions in the first place, was getting the students to be independent of uh, when carrying out this practical work, not continually coming back to me saying, what do I do next? What do I do next? And a lot of the time was just, you know, go on to step four, go on to step five, but they, they didn't seem to be uh, able or willing to follow that through uh, with the uh, traditional instructions. Um, on average, they were um, asking a uh, few questions, only one um, impractical question for every two students. And the majority of those questions still were uh, referred back to the instructions. And it was very easy because I was standing at the front with it projected on the board um, and I could just point to which instruction is next. And uh, mostly they got the idea that I wasn't going to tell them what to do next. It was literally just tick the box, follow through uh, and, you know, work this out for yourself. You've got everything you need in front of you. Um, their answers to the observation questions were mostly uh, partially appropriate. So I just uh, coded these as inappropriate, appropriate or partially appropriate. Um, so it, it's not the magic bullet. Uh, none of these things are a magic bullet. Um, some of them still weren't making the observations I thought they would be making. But one of the advantages of practical work being done quicker uh, because there was less um, of the 
kind of uh, back and forth of trying to get them to do the practical. Um, there was more time in the lesson for us to come together as a group and discuss the observations. Um, I could um, show pictures of you know good quality uh, observations so that we can talk about the chemistry um, behind and variable responses to the reasons for the practical steps. So again, this is you know all part of their training as a chemist. They they might not necessarily understand why they've done step three or why they've done step four, but again, I can. Um, I've got more time in the class for them to uh, talk about those things and uh, learn those things uh, afterwards. In terms of their opinions on the integration instructions, um, I use a Likert scale uh, one to five uh, in terms of how easy they found uh, the practical work and they were all ranking it one to three. So uh, very easy, easy or um, neither easy, not or uh, not easy. Um, in terms of their written feedback, there was quite a lot of indication that they liked the clarity of the instructions. They could see what they were supposed to be doing. Um, so uh, I liked the, the first uh, comment. It helped me do the practical without asking the teacher, gave them that intrinsic motivation. They could do it themselves rather than having to refer to the external expert. And this idea of confidence, they knew that they were doing the right thing because they could see that the equipment uh, was like what it was on the diagram. So they could they had more confidence to carry on uh, through the practical. For me, uh, the key thing was I was um, spending a lot less time dealing with um, what uh, Johnson called these thoughtless questions. Questions that if the students you know, sat down and spent maybe 10 more seconds thinking about it, they probably could uh, have worked out what to do, um, but not learned helplessness. But sometimes you do get students who are just like, what do I do next? What do I do next? Not wanting to engage with um, the, the written instructions, perhaps. Um, and I was hearing the students start to self and peer correct each other. You know, Johnny was saying, what do I do next? And uh, Billy next to him saying, have you done step three? Well, do step four, you know, increase in independence, which is really good. And it gave them that visual cue um, during the practical and afterwards um, that they could, you know, go back a week later, a month later and still talk about that practical uh, quite effectively. So all of that was written up in a uh, article in Journal of Chemical Education published uh, last year. Um, so it's been viewed over 500 times, um, which I'm quite happy about. Um, and part of the process of doing this and blogging about it and talking about it uh, online was to just put together all the AQA, all the AQA um, instructions for the so-called required practicals. Um, so I just went through those because uh, they were useful uh, for myself and I put them out and they seem to be quite popular. Uh, I did all the physics practicals as well because I was teaching some GCSE physics uh, last year and then I couldn't leave it uh, unfinished so I've done all the biology practicals as well. Um, some of these biology practicals when you kind of go down into what's required of them they're pretty complex practicals they uh, take quite a bit of thinking and making the integration instructions for some of these uh, was quite challenging it took me quite a while to work out how to break down uh, the written instructions into uh, easy pictorial diagrams. So the osmosis one uh, was uh, particularly uh, interesting um, and the one to the right of it at uh, number four uh, took a, a little bit of time to work out how, how they worked. Um, they seem to be quite popular. They've been downloads, downloaded a few thousand times um, and I get some good feedback from people that um, they've proved useful with their uh, students. So plenty more on um, my blog. Um, and I'm on Twitter. If you want to follow me, you can email me directly here. And um, there are some of the references, uh, including the reference to my paper um, that I've talked about here. Thanks very much.